thank you everybody to wake up this early in the morning and come for the uh, CV Imaging Grand Rounds. I just wanted to introduce uh, my mentor and I trained under Dr. Dipin Shah from uh, Houston Methodist. He has seen the journey of cardiac MRI from 2002 till now, the viability story and everything live. So, he, and you know, even in the valvular space, there is a lot of research that's going on. He has published extensively. Dr. Shaw serves as the chief of cardiovascular imaging at Piedmont, uh, at <laughs> Methodist DeBakey. It's a prestigious position there. The prior people who served there, William Zockby, Miguel Quinones. Uh, he's, he's, it's a huge legacy. And uh, thank you, Dipin. Thank you for coming down and th giving these grand rounds on uh, cardiac MRI and valvular heart disease. Okay. Well, th thank you very much, Venkat. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and also uh, so impressed to see the success that you've achieved here. I'm very proud of you. So um, uh, it's kind of, I just found out today is actually National Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. So I think it's very uh, apropos uh, that I'm here talking to you about the, the role of cardiac MRI in valvular heart disease. And what I'm gonna do is kind of walk through a few different valvular lesions, talk a little bit about how cardiac MRI works, um, and then also bring up areas where there's still, I think, opportunities for further insights to be achieved. So, and I always start off uh, any talk of MRI in valvular heart disease really with an echo. And the reason obviously is because most of these patients, that's where their initial evaluations are gonna start off with. Uh, and so here's an example of a 40-year-old woman who presented with a heart murmur, uh, and her initial echocardiogram is shown here, where you can see there's a very eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation that's posteriorly directed, and the patient was referred on for an MRI. And, and I'll tell you that, um, you, know, I, you know, when I look at the role of MRI in valvular heart disease, I think it really uh, had a huge boost when the... 2017 ASC valvular heart disease guideline actually incorporated uh, a role for cardiac MRI in the evaluation of these patients. And obviously this is for mitral regurgitation. This is kind of the algorithm that the ASC proposed. Uh, and, and you'll notice there's a couple areas where they call out certain areas where there's potential limitations with echocardiography in patients with very eccentric jets or in patients with non holosystolic jets. And the guidelines specifically do call out that there's a role for cardiac MRI, uh, specifically for quantitation in these patients. So here's what I'm gonna do is, is talk a little bit about how it is that we do valvular heart disease assessment by CMR, uh, and then go through a few specific lesions, primary mitral regurgitation, uh, secondary MR, where we're really much more looking at the, 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 the health of the ventricle, uh, aortic regurgitation, and then touch a little bit on uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation, which I think is really kind of the, the newest frontier. So first thing people always ask me is, okay, so do I need a, a fancy scanner uh, with, um, you know, kind of advanced sequences? And the reality is to do a valve assessment by CMR, you really need basically these two basic sequences. Your Cine MRI, which every MRI scanner will be able to do, and phase contrast uh, MRI, which again is available now on, on every scanner. So these are sequences that have been around for 20 years or more, uh, and really very robust and reproducible sequences. Um, and, and it starts off really the assessment with assessing uh, uh, ventricular volumes. And I think all of us you know, would say that uh, CMR has, has a pretty well-established role in assessment of ventricular volumes for end diastolic volume uh, and systolic volume and ejection fraction. And this really forms the crux of what we do uh, when we're doing valvular heart disease assessment. And really there's validation literature going back uh, almost 30, 30, 40 years, uh, showing in fact that the, the values that you get by MRI uh, closely correlate with uh, a, a reference standard. Uh, and the advantages obviously are because of the good endocardial border delineation, there's limited need for geometric assumptions. Now. In addition to the left ventricle, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how MRI is also very useful for assessing the right ventricle, and, and this comes into play when we're trying to look at tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and then what about this phase contrast CMR? So when I show these images, people say, oh, this is kind of a unique looking image. I think for those of you that have seen echo images, this is kind of the MRI equivalent of the echo Doppler. So this is basically a velocity map 
And here we've done it in the ascending aorta, and by simply drawing a region of interest, we can actually get a, a, uh, a processed uh, 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 curve which shows us what the flow is across the entire cardiac cycle. Uh, and you can summate that flow together. And again, this is available now on, on almost all commercial post-processing software tools. And this technique also has been very well validated uh, both uh, in vivo in patients as well as in flow phantoms as well. Um, and again, the nice thing, just like with echo, you can not just measure in the ascending aorta, you can measure in the pulmonary artery, you can measure really at any location you want by simply placing a imaging volume at that location. So when we're uh, applying these basic principles, what's our primary goal is to say, look, we know that there should be equal flow across all chambers of the heart. And if we use knowledge of this principle, then what we'd expect is in a normal case, your LV stroke volume, your RV stroke volume, aortic flow, PA flow should all match. And if there's a discordance where there's a higher amount of flow across one of these uh, structures, then that's, that's your indicator that there's regurgitation, valvular regurgitation, and then obviously you can quantitate the severity of the regurgitation. So here's the goals that we try to achieve. One obviously is, is determining the severity of the valvular lesion. But also importantly, I think, is to look at the mechanism of the abnormality. And then I think a real strength of CMR is to assess the consequences of that lesion. And by that, I mean the, the remodeling that occurs to the ventricle uh, or the atrium as a result. We'll touch a little bit on how CMR and echo compare against each other. Um, and then really I'll kind of cap this talk off with scenarios where uh, MRI can be useful in valve disease assessment. So uh, let's start off, and, and, and I thought the approach I would take is we'll just kind of go around the different valves. We'll start with the mitral, because again, this is probably the most common valve disease that we encounter. Going back to that patient that I showed you at the very beginning of this talk, uh, who's got a very uh, eccentric, posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation. And so here's what the standard kind of cine images by CMR would look like. And we can see on this short axis view, as well as this three chamber and the four chamber view, there's a signal void here uh, posteriorly with a very eccentric uh, directed jet. But beyond just uh, identifying the presence of a regurgitant lesion, our goal is gonna be to say, what is the severity of that lesion? And the principle here for mitral regurgitation assessment is really simply compare what is the left ventricle ejecting out based on the stroke volume uh, by planimetry of the end diastolic and end systolic volume Compare that to what's going out of the ascending aorta, and that's using our phase contrast technique. And then the difference between these two would represent the mitral regurgitation, provided there's no ventricular septal defect. So one of the advantages, since this is a purely volumetric-based technique, is that it doesn't really matter if there's a changing degree of regurgitation throughout systole, so these Barlow's non-holosystolic jets. It doesn't matter if it's an eccentric jet, or if it's a mobile mitral regurgitation jet because you're not trying to specifically image at the jet itself. And so for this patient, this is the full set of city images, which we can use this to determine what the LV stroke volume is and what the LV end diastolic volume and end systolic volume. So this person, we had 170 cc's uh, of LV end, uh, or LV stroke volume, but when we measure the flow coming out the aorta, is only 93 cc's, so therefore that difference tells us there's a significant amount of mitral regurgitation, in this case about 83 mLs, and a regurgitant fraction of 47%, really suggesting severe mitral regurgitation in this case. Now, in addition to that kind of primary methodology that I talked about, we've got other secondary checks that we can utilize as well, and I'm not gonna bore you with the specific methods, but again, the idea is you don't wanna hang your hat on any single method, you wanna get confirmation by looking at multiple different confirmatory checks. Um, in addition to that, you can also look at the size of the jet itself, so you can do something called uh, assessment of the anatomic regurgent orifice area, and that's what's shown here, where we actually are, are doing a series of cine images at the mitral co-optation uh, region, and actually then we can measure the size of the regurgitant orifice. Uh, and there's, sorry, there's data showing that an anatomic regurgitant orifice of greater than 0.4 centimeters uh, has fairly high sensitivity and specificity for grade three or four plus mitral regurgitation. So coming back now to 
what's the cause of the regurgitation because that's also important is to look at the mechanism and, and obviously I think you know TE is oftentimes the technique that we utilize but while the patient's in the MRI scanner getting a, an assessment of severity I think it's also important to look at the mechanism as well I'm showing you examples of a few different uh, mitral pathologies the patient on the right hand side has single leaflet posterior pr prolapse the patient on the left hand side here has uh, really a uh, large billowy bileaflet prolapse, uh, you know, classic of uh, the Barlow syndrome. And our goal here would be to do a series of uh, images, uh, a, you know, in a three-chamber orientation, but not just through the center of the ventricle, but actually more anterior as well as more inferior, so that we have a stack of images that's shown here. And then from the stack, you can actually try to localize where the jet originates and therefore where the likely abnormality is. And for example, in this case, we can see that the coaptation defect really is situated more inferiorly along the A3, P3 interface. And we can see, in fact, that there's a problem uh, right here between the P2, I mean the P3 and A3 interface, uh, resulting in this very eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. Now, um, what's the data for this, uh, for mechanism assessment? So this actually is a study that's now about 15 years old, where they looked at a series of patients that were all going to surgery, and they said uh, they, they all underwent a transesophageal echo and a CMR uh, to assess the mechanism, and they found really that, that MRI and TE both performed reasonably well uh, at identifying either anterior or posterior leaflet uh, pathology using the surgical findings a as a reference standard. But the one area I think that TE performed better uh, was in depicting the torn chordae because, again, the MRI uh, is acquired over several cardiac cycles, whereas the TE is done in real time and it's got much higher resolution. So I think it's important for us to recognize both the strengths as well as the limitations of CMR. Um, now, how does CMR compare to ECHO when it comes to assessment of severity? Now, obviously, whenever I bring this study up, it, it causes heartburn for, for some of my ECHO colleagues, and I'm going to kind of walk you through you know, my interpretation of this. And this was a study where they looked at a series of patients that underwent uh, CMR as well as transthoracic echo. And then what they did is they used uh, the reverse or modeling after mitral valve correction as their reference standard. And what they found, first off, at, at a baseline assessment, if you compare the severity of, of uh, mitral regurgitation assessed by CMR, compared to echo, there was still modest correlation between the two techniques with an R value of about 0.6. But there is some variability and some scatter. Um, what they did find is that you know, there's a relationship both by echo grading of mitral regurgitation and the uh, magnitude of reverse remodeling uh, as there is by MRI. But the MRI gave you a tighter relationship uh, with reverse remodeling after mitral valve correction. But I think probably more, more uh, informative, I think, is this uh, more recent study, which came out in 2018 from a, a European group, where they did not only transthoracic echo, but also TEE, as well as CMR, in a series of about 250 patients that were asymptomatic with mitral regurgitation. And their objective was not just to look at concordance or discordance, but actually to try to find out what are the scenarios where you have a discordance between the MRI uh, and the echo. What they found was that three quarters of the time, uh, grading of mitral regurg by CMR was similar to grading uh, assessment by echo. But in about a quarter of the cases, there was a discordance. And the three scenarios that most likely led to a discordance was when there was a late systolic jet, when there were multiple mitral regurgitation jets, and when there were eccentric jets. So, and so again, if you go back to the ASC valve guidelines, which were published in 2017, which at that time, the recommendations were really more expert consensus uh, uh, you know, or, or expert uh, opinion, uh, I think this study very nicely, which came about a year later, actually provided some evidence base also to say these are the scenarios where we're most likely to see a discordance and where there may be a benefit to getting an MRI study. Uh, and, and in this study, they also followed these asymptomatic patients out over time, and what they found was that the MRI grading of severity uh, most closely correlated with decompensation uh, and need for mitral valve surgery. So let me turn now to 
the consequences of the venture goal. And I think this is really the area where, where CMR shines, which is an assessment of the remodeling of the ventricle. So I'm, I'm showing you an example case here. I'm sure all of us have seen a case like this in our practice, which is this is a patient who's got bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, the classic Barlow syndrome. You can see on the transthoracic, there's a small color jet. Uh, and actually, you know, by, uh, by PISA uh, quantification, uh, we get about 18 cc's of mitral regurgitation. So again, mild mitral regurgitation. But if you look at the size of this ventricle, this is over a six centimeter ventricle. So this is a dilated LV, despite the fact there's only mild mitral regurgitation. Um, this person got an MRI scan as well. And the MRI also confirmed that the mitral regurgitation was only mild. I think we got 20 cc's, but the LV size is quite enlarged. LV end diastolic volume is almost 300 cc's. So again, this is, you know, if you look through the literature, there's a, a number of publications in the literature that talk about, you know, is there a cardiomyopathy that occurs in patients with Barlow's disease where they have this disproportionate LV enlargement? So mild mitral regurgitation, but yet a significant enlargement of the left ventricle. And so one of the things, you know, as we were doing MRI scans on these patients, you know, we began to notice that clearly some of these patients do have an enlarged ventricle. What's interesting is if you look at the flow, and again, you know, as I talked about earlier, you know, we're trying to compare what goes out the left ventricle from the aorta versus what's ejected out as far as the LV stroke volume. Well, there's this other volume of flow which is pushed up by the left ventricular muscle. It actually pushes the, the, the leaflets up into the left atrium, but it doesn't actually cross the, the leaflets and go into the atrium. So it's technically not mitral regurgitation, but what about this volume right here? And so we coined the term the prolapse volume. It's a prolapsing volume, uh, and this volume essentially is recirculating back and forth. It's not going into the atrium, but it's going up, pushing up uh, above the annulus, and then in, in diastole, it comes back down into the ventricle. <clears throat> And so, you know, and this is also a dilemma that you have when you're trying to do quantitation by MRI, which is how do you account for this volume? Do you consider this during systole as atrial volume? Do you consider this as ventricular volume? Or do you consider this as what we coined this term, this prolapse volume, to think of it as, as kind of a separate entity in and of itself? And so one of our fellows at the time uh, worked on this to say, let's look at these patients. And we've got this, you know, technique by MRI where we can look at remodeling of the ventricle very nicely. If we can quantify the amount of this prolapse volume in each of these patients and see how does that somehow account for this disproportionate LV remodeling that we see in some of these patients with Barlow's disease. And so what we did is we used uh, a control group of patients with single leaflet prolapse where there's really not a huge recirculating prolapse volume. And if you look at the amount of regurgitation mitral regurgitation, and the size of the left ventricle, you can see that the patients with bileaflet prolapse have, for, for any given level, a larger left ventricle for any amount of mitral regurgitation. But what's interesting is once you correct for this prolapsing volume, the lines are almost superimposed upon each other, suge suggesting at least one line of evidence that it's this prolapse volume that's leading to this extra recirculating load that's accounting for this disproportionate LV enlargement. Uh, and so I think the conclusions of this investigation were, one, when we looked at this series of about uh, 200 patients uh, with mitral valve prolapse, we noticed that there's, a, there's really quite a, a, a bit of heterogeneity in the amount of this prolapse volume, anywhere from 4 cc's up to as much as 45 mLs uh, in some patients. Um, and that it does seem that this uh, prolapse volume uh, exerts an additional volume load on the left ventricle and may explain this disproportionate LV enlargement. Uh, obviously, the question now that still needs to be answered is, should you take this additional volume load into account when you're doing decision making as far as when to send a patient to surgery? And really, I think what this means is, should some of these patients with bilethal prolapse get sent to surgery earlier, uh, not just because of the transvalvular MR that they have, but also because of the additional load they have from, this, uh, from the mitral valve prolapse? Now, the, the other thing also we noticed in prolapse patients was if you look at the, the dynamics of the left ventricle, uh, here's a patient on the left-hand side is a normal volunteer. And if you look at the, the way that the left ventricular lateral wall contracts and you look at the, the papillary muscle, the posterior papillary muscle descends down towards the apex. Uh, 
But notice what happens in these patients, especially the bileaflet prolapse patients, is that this papillary muscle is actually getting pulled up. So you've got, as these leaflets are, are prolapsing into the left atrium, they're actually pulling up on this papillary muscle, and you see this kind of peculiar motion, almost accentuated hyperdynamic motion in the basal infralateral wall. And so when we're doing MRI on these patients, one of the things that we always do, because we have the ability to look not just at volumetric measures, but also with contrast administration to look at scar formation, is we notice there's scar in these patients with mitral valve prolapse, and it tends to occur in a specific location in the infralateral wall. And so that's what prompted us to do this investigation right here, which was published about five years ago in Jack, where, and, and interestingly, around the same time, there was a uh, series that came out uh, from an autopsy study uh, from the uh, Veneto uh, region of Italy, where they found actually in patients that had died under the age of 40 with no other pathology that could be identified, uh, that there was fibrosis present on the autopsy samples, uh, again, in that same location in that infralateral wall. Um, so providing some histologic evidence as well uh, is what we found on MRI, which is when we compared patients with prolapse versus those uh, with, with primary MR not due to mitral valve prolapse, you can see that there's a much higher prevalence of scar in the prolapse patients but it tends to occur primarily in this area right here, in the basal to mid, inferior and infralateral wall. So again, the segments that are adjacent to the posterior medial papillary muscle. And that there seems to be a relationship with increasing mitral regurgitation severity. So in the prolapse patients who had severe mitral regurgitation, we found that there was almost half of these patients had evidence of myocardial scar identifiable by cardiac MRI, whereas the patients uh, with primary MR without prolapse had really a low prevalence of uh, scar that was not related uh, to severity of mitral regurgitation. And then interestingly, when we follow these patients out over time, and again, this was a, a small single center experience um, with about a mean follow-up of about three to four years, we noticed that there's a higher incidence of arrhythmic events in these mitral valve prolapse patients with scar. Uh, and so in this group here, uh, when we looked at the incidence of sudden death, aborted sudden death or VT requiring ICD placement, the annualized event rate was close to 4% in the MVP patients with SCAR versus less than 1% uh, in MVP patients without SCAR or in patients without mitral valve prolapse. And so again, I think it brought up the, the concept that, that this really may be the anatomic substrate that we see for arrhythmias in these patients with mitral valve prolapse. And I think obviously further work needs to be done to still establish whether SCAR should represent now uh, a potential rhythmic substrate in prolapse patients. And then also, whenever I show this data to our surgical colleagues, uh, they're always fascinated by the idea that when we look at what happens to the dynamics of the lateral wall and the papillary muscle after mitral valve repair, you'll notice this is an example of a patient on the left-hand side before surgery and on the right-hand side after mitral valve repair, and that unusual papillary muscle motion now uh, has normalized. So now you, don't, you no longer have that traction on the papillary muscle. And the question again becomes, you know, could there be an indication in the future for patients with a rhythmic mitral valve prolapse that maybe earlier surgery may be of benefit? Again, I think more work still needs to be done uh, to determine if that's the case or not. Now let's move on to secondary MR uh, where it's less of a problem with the valve itself and much more of a problem with the ventricle. And again, this is where, you know, 20 years of work that's been done in cardiac MRI to look at tissue composition uh, uh, of the heart uh, using uh, late gallium enhancement techniques, I think, uh, really uh, stand out. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, a patient, you can see, has kind of the classic ischemic secondary mitral regurgitation. You can see a thinned out uh, infralateral wall, a, a tethered restricted posterior leaflet, uh, and a posteriorly directed jet of mitral regurgitation. On our delayed enhancement MRI, we can see there's an area of transmural uh, infarct in this region. And so the question obviously is, you know, we, we've got uh, data showing that patients who have secondary MR, uh, mitral uh, assessment of SCAR seems to be uh, a marker of prognosis. And so this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic group where they looked both at the severity of mitral regurgitation 
as well as the extent of the infarct size. And what they found was that in patients with larger infarct size, the overall prognosis was much worse in these patients. Uh, so that really, the prognosis in these patients was influenced both by mitral regurgitation severity as well as the size of the infarct, uh, indicating that it's the tissue health that's an important driver of prognosis in these patients. Now that study was looking at, at patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, <clears throat> we had a, another investigation where we looked at patients that but were both ischemic as well as non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And one of the things that you notice, especially in the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, where there's oftentimes very little or no scar pre uh, present, is that these patients can have a, a, a reasonable chance of improvement with medical therapy. So here's a patient I'm showing you who's got at least moderate mitral regurgitation, uh, regurgitation fraction of 40%. The ejection fraction is very low at 22%. And this person, after six months of optimal medical therapy, has, gotten, has improved his ejection fraction to 51%. And we can see that the mitral regurgitation is almost gone. Uh, on follow-up, the mitral regurgitation is only 10%. <clears throat> And, and this goes back to some early studies that were done almost 20 years ago when we looked at patients with cardiomyopathy and said, okay, if, if they're getting medical therapy with beta blockers, can the extent of scar that we detect by MRI, can that actually help us to identify those that are likely to improve? And so this is just segmental data, but showing in fact that from on a segmental basis, for those segments that have no scar, there's a much higher likelihood of improvement versus those segments that have an extensive amount of scar. Um, and so, so using that as a backdrop, we uh, studied a, a cohort of almost 500 patients with cardiomyopathy uh, and secondary mitral regurgitation. Uh, and what we found, obviously, is that mitral regurgitation severity was associated with the prognosis in these patients. Those that had a regurgitation fraction of less than 30% did better than those with a mitral regurgitation fraction of more than 30%. But interestingly, the group that did the best, irrespective of the amount of mitral regurgitation, were those patients with ischemic or with secondary MR, but they had no scar in the ventricle. Um, and in fact, really, the uh, the impact of mitral regurgitation seemed to be the most significant in the patients with an intermediate scar burden. In those with low scar burden, the overall prognosis was better. In those with a very extensive scar burden, there was a, those patients had a worse outcome, and in those cases, the, the incremental uh, impact of the secondary mitral regurgitation was not as significant. And so I think it brings about the idea that when we're looking at patients with secondary MR, which again is really a complex disorder, uh, we want to look probably not just at the severity of the regurgitation, but also at the health of the ventricle vis-a-vis uh, -vis the scar uh, extent within the myocardium. So let me turn now to the aortic valve. And again, you know, this is an area where, uh, especially in patients with uh, uh, bicuspid aortic valve, there's been a lot of work that's been done to identify uh, not just the anatomic uh, abnormality of the valve itself, but also to look at the aorta to identify the associated aortopathy. Um, and again, that's kind of one of the indications I think that you would clearly think about referring a patient with aortic valve disease uh, is if you want to look at the severity of the regurgitation, but also uh, look at the uh, uh, size of the aorta. Um, what's the mechanism by which we would uh, assess aortic regurgitation severity? Uh, and so really, uh, for aortic regurgitation, the methodology is a little bit easier because all you do is you place your imaging plane right above the aortic valve, and you can measure directly what the reverse uh, flow is. So here in this case, we're measuring both the forward flow or the anterograde flow across the aortic valve, as well as the retrograde flow. And we can see in this patient, there's 80 cc's of reverse flow, suggesting really severe aortic regurgitation. Um, and again, just as with mitral regurgitation, there's other confirmatory checks that we can utilize as well by just simply comparing the forward flow across the LVOT to the flow across the pulmonary artery, which again, in the absence of an intracardiac shunt, should be, uh, the, the difference there should be equivalent to what your aortic regurgitation is. Uh, and also we can look at the size of the anatomic regurgitant orifice. Just like we talked about for the mitral valve, you can look at an ARO, uh, and in this particular study, a anatomic regurgitant orifice area of more than 0.28, had fairly good sensitivity and specificity for identifying three or four plus aortic regurgitation. In addition to that, obviously, just as our echo colleagues utilize, 
uh, you can look for holodiastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, and in this particular study, uh, flow reversal in the descending aorta also had fairly high sensitivity and specificity for identifying grade four aortic regurgitation. And then lastly, uh, this was a study out of the UK which followed a series of asymptomatic patients who had moderate or severe aortic regurgitation by echo. They went through and quantified the severity of aortic regurgitation uh, by CMR, and they found that both the severity of regurgitation by CMR stratified patients that were likely to decompensate during follow-up, uh, but also the size of the ventricle, the LV end diastolic volume uh, in these aortic regurgitation patients could also be a discriminator of who's likely to go on to decompensate. And then, let me skip past here. And then uh, a recent investigation that we did was again in the aortic regurgitation space, is there a role for looking at the health of the ventricle uh, and therefore looking at scar presence in aortic regurgitation patients? And this was a cohort of about 400 patients with moderate or severe aortic regurgitation. And we found is that uh, similar to, you know, the wealth of data that's been shown in aortic stenosis, that, that patients with chronic aortic regurgitation who have scar actually have a worse prognosis than those patients with aortic regurgitation who do not have scar. And, and that relationship seemed to hold true whether it's an ischemic pattern of scar due to a prior infarct or uh, to a non-ischemic pattern of scar that we think is actually due to the uh, aortic regurgitation itself. Um, and, and interestingly, uh, it held true both for uh, patients with an uh, ejection fraction of less than 50%, as well as those with an ejection fraction of more than 50%. Uh, and then I think, you know, this, uh, you know, th these findings certainly raise the possibility that, again, could there be a role for using the presence of SCAR as, as a marker for earlier intervention uh, in patients with chronic aortic regurgitation? So let me uh, skip forward now um, to kind of the last lesion, and I think the area where I think cardiology is, is, is really kind of at the forefront investigating further, which is the tricuspid valve. And if you look at the, the 2017 ASC valve guidelines, you know, there's kind of an algorithm for how by echo you would assess uh, tricuspid regurgitation, but I think there is um, a, a caveat that's put there that clinical experience with quantitation of TR uh, is much more limited uh, than it is with mitral and aortic regurgitation. And I think this statement holds true not just for echocardiography, but also for cardiac MRI as well. Um, but I think fortunately in the last few years, there's been several investigations that have been done to kind of help define the role of cardiac MRI uh, for assessment of, of tricuspid regurgitation. Now, obviously when we're talking about tricuspid regurgitation, what we see in clinical practice the vast majority of the time is going to be the secondary or functional tricuspid regurgitation, which can either be due to, uh, uh, you know, left, right atrial dilatation, commonly from atrial fib, uh, leading to a tricuspid annular uh, enlargement, uh, or it can be due to either pulmonary, uh, vascular, or left-sided pathology, uh, which leads to uh, RV remodeling, and therefore then kind of a leaflet tenting uh, for the tricuspid leaflets. And so there was an investigation that we did a couple years ago. Where we said, okay, let's look at a series of patients that have tricuspid regurgitation, quantify them by CMR, and see if CMR quantitation actually is associated with prognosis. Now, one of the things is that since most of these patients were uh, enrolled and studied uh, before the era of tricuspid intervention, we're able to follow the natural history in these patients as well. And the methodology that we utilize is actually very similar to what we do for the mitral valve, where we would simply look at what is the stroke volume of the right ventricle, compare that to what the forward flow is going out the pulmonary artery using the phase contrast technique, uh, and then that difference would represent your tricuspid regurgitation. And so this is one of our fellows at the time that worked on this uh, project, um, and I'm showing you one example case here where you can see an RV end diastolic volume over 300 cc's, an end systolic volume of 160 leading to a stroke volume of 170 cc's, but the forward flow out the PA is only about 110 mLs. So you've got a significant difference here between the two, and this represents then the, the uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So this was a series of over 500 patients that were followed for about three years. Uh, and here's what we found is if we looked at the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, both looking at tricuspid regurgitant volume, 
as well as looking at tricuspid regurgent fraction where you index it to the right ventricular stroke volume, you can see increasing TR severity was associated with a worse prognosis. And again, this is looking at natural history. And this was independent of uh, other clinical uh, and imaging covariates, including RV ejection fraction, mitral regurgitation severity, and pulmonary artery pressures. And I think over the last few years, there's been more and more investigations that have been done that really show that, that, that secondary tricuspid regurgitation does have an independent prognostic uh, significance. And therefore, uh, there's a group of patients that really will benefit from intervention uh, for secondary TR. Now, beyond the severity of regurgitation, are there RV remodeling measures that can also help you to risk stratify these patients with secondary or functional TR? And so this was a, a series uh, from a group out in Korea where they looked at patients that were all going for tricuspid valve surgery, uh, and they looked at their baseline RV ejection fraction uh, to see if that uh, is associated with worse uh, survival during follow-up. And what they found was that an RV ejection fraction of less than 46% in the setting of significant tricuspid regurgitation was associated with a worse outcome than those patients who had an RV ejection fraction of more than 46%. Interestingly, we had a recent study that was, uh, one of our fellows just presented this at the SCMR meeting, uh, looking at a series of over 1,000 patients with moderate or severe functional uh, tricuspid regurgitation, uh, looking at uh, outcomes. And again, we found that uh, RV ejection fraction threshold of about 47% uh, was the best stratifier uh, between those that had an uh, adverse prognosis versus that had a favorable prognosis. Um, the other thing also, if you look at the tricuspid valve, although we think of most cases of tricuspid regurgitation as secondary. One of the things that and you'll notice is that oftentimes uh, in the MRI lab, we'll notice uh, what looks like prolapse of the tricuspid valve leaflets. Uh, and here's an example here. You can see this on the four chamber view, as well as on this uh, RV three chamber view here, that you've got these kind of uh, somewhat thickened uh, uh, tricuspid leaflets that seem to be prolapsing uh, back into the right atrium. One of the questions is, is there's really not any specific gu guideline or criteria for how you define tricuspid, tricuspid prolapse. And so uh, that was one of the investigations that this is uh, published in Jack just this week. One of our fellows looked at a cohort of patients and we started off looking at normals first to say, let's look at what is the normal displacement of the tricuspid leaflets uh, to get an idea of what's considered abnormal. Um, and then we then apply those criteria to a series of patients with mitral valve prolapse, as well as to a series of patients with primary MR not due to prolapse. And what we, what we found from a criteria standpoint is if you use two millimeters of displacement of the tricuspid leaflets into the right atrium for the anterior and posterior tricuspid leaflets, that seemed to be the, the, um, the best criteria that separated between what normal uh, tricuspid displacement is for the septal leaflet because again the the you know because of the positioning of the the tricuspid annulus that you really need to use a three millimeter uh, displacement to identify uh, prolapse of the septal tricuspid leaflet and using these criteria we found is that none of the healthy volunteers and none of the primary MR patients met these criteria for tricuspid valve prolapse but interestingly uh, patients with mitral valve prolapse uh, anywhere from a third to a half of them actually met criteria for tricuspid valve prolapse, much more common in those with bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, and also some association with severity of, of left-sided mitral regurgitation, suggesting, in fact, that, that maybe this myxomatous process that's affecting the mitral valve may also be having an effect on the tricuspid valve as well. And then when we look at the kind of the clinical implications of this, uh, what we noticed is those patients who had tricuspid valve prolapse uh, tended to have a greater degree of tricuspid regurgitation uh, with a higher prevalence of moderate or severe TR in the patients with tricuspid prolapse versus those patients uh, without tricuspid prolapse. And so I think, you know, what it really brings up is that, you know, when we look at patients with mitral valve disease and we're thinking about sending them to, to the operating room, I think it may be useful to make sure that we also look carefully at the tricuspid valve as well, because in fact, there may be a primary tricuspid pathology in some of these patients that oftentimes we just kind of attribute it to, or think it's secondary tricuspid regurgitation.
So let me finish off here with kind of future directions. And um, you know, I think a few things that I want to uh, uh, highlight is there's you know kind of this multi-center valve CMR collaboration that we've been able to put together, uh, thanks to Venkat and his uh, participation in this as well, um, with four different sites across the U.S. that all have high volume uh, cardiac MRI. Uh, that have ex experience and expertise in valvular heart disease. And, and these are just some of the uh, uh, abstracts that are coming out at presentations that are coming out at ACC. Uh, and hopefully, I think what we'll see in the future is a greater role for cardiac MRI in helping us to improve uh, care of our patients. So I, I kind of took you on a little bit of a whirlwind tour around the different valves. I want to kind of bring it back home and wrap up here to say, okay, you're seeing a patient in clinic. What are scenarios where you would think about getting a cardiac MRI on a patient. And I think, you know, based on what the published data is, as well as what the expert consensus is, I think these are what kind of the take home message. I think patients where you have a technically limited transthoracic echo, obviously that's a case where if you can't assess it accurately by TE, you want to think about moving on to some other modality. Uh, when there's a discordance between the history, the physical, and the 2D Doppler findings, by that, what if you've got a patient who's got a very loud murmur, but on echo you're not seeing much regurgitation? What if you've got a very large ventricle, but you're only seeing mild mitral regurgitation? Those are cases where there's discordance, and the, the general recommendation is those are scenarios where you'd want to think about sending a patient for CMR. Also, uh, when there's an eccentric regurgitant jet, when there's a non-holosystolic jet, like we see in the, the patients with uh, Barlow's disease, when there's multiple jets uh, or multiple valvular lesions, I didn't have time uh, to get into how CMR assesses multivalve disease, but I think this is also an area that's a strength of CMR, where you've got mitral regurgitation and coexisting aortic regurgitation as well, and you want to try to separate out which, how much is, is coming from each lesion. Uh, and then I think really, uh, very importantly, is when you want to assess the consequences of the valve lesion and look at the health of the ventricle. And, and this is really both from the standpoint of quantitation of volumes, quantitation of LV ejection fraction, but I think most importantly, uh, assessment of myocardial viability and myocardial scar. And so with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Oh, no, sir, thank you. I have a question. <clears throat> um, hearing about mitral valve prolapse and sudden death gives us heartburn, of course. Do you think that anyone with mitral valve prolapse and say PVCs or perhaps some displaced uh, leaflet should simply get an MR and maybe even a loop record or something like that? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, you know, this is actually, the NIH had a uh, entire uh, work group last December to try to say, let's identify what are the priorities in mitral valve prolapse because there's a lot that's unknown. I, I will tell you in, in our practice, you know, I think, I don't think every single patient with mitral valve prolapse is getting an MRI scan, and nor do I think they, they all should. I think if you've got a question of severity regurgitation, that's an area where I think MRI can be useful, and that's especially in the Barlow's cases. And then from the arrhythmic side, I think it's patients who have either, you know, arrhythmic symptoms or who on a Holter monitor uh, have evidence of ventricular arrhythmia. Those are patients that, in Houston at least, are, are generally getting an MRI scan. Uh, to assess for the scar substrate. Now, ultimately, what do we do with that? We don't know yet. We've got some observational registries where we're trying to say, can we come up with a, a risk score for mitral valve prolapse? Um, but I think that's still a few years out, similar to what's done in Hokum. Um, so I think certainly patients that declare themselves with some symptoms, or if you have evidence of uh, you know, ventricular arrhythmia or ectopy on EKG or, or monitoring, I think those are patients that, yeah, definitely should. I think that the, the kind of, there's a European expert consensus that says most of these uh, MVP patients should at least get an annual Holter to assess for the arrhythmic complications. And then what do you do beyond that? I think, you know, vis-a-vis -vis MRI or other things, I think we're still evolving. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Thank you again, Dr. Shaw, for, for a great presentation and overview. You know, one thing that you didn't comment on is direct flow quantitation of mitral regurgitation, and I know there's issues with, with how it's oriented. What are your thoughts on doing direct quantitation? Yeah, so, so direct quantitation, I think, is going to be challenging because, again, these, these jets are oftentimes can be very eccentric, and then also you've got the mitral annulus itself is descending down. 
So there is some work that's being done using like a 4D flow where you do a full volumetric uh, flow assessment. Uh, and then you have kind of a valve tracking mechanism. Uh, but I, I, you know, I would say that that's still not ready for prime time. So one concept that's out there, Deppen, is uh, 4D flow, uh, utilizing 4D flow to assess different valves. Okay. Where does that stand in clinical utility right now? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, 4D flow basically is kind of doing a full 3D volumetric assessment of the heart uh, and then doing it with flow data as well. Um, advantages, obviously, are that you can then pick any imaging plane you want offline. You're not dependent on getting a particular plane at the time of the scan. The challenges are the acquisition time is, is typically a 8 to 10 minute acquisition uh, it requires kind of free breathing with motion correction and things like that. Uh, and the overall resolution of that, the temporal resolution is not as high as you typically want for valve disease. Most 40 flow sequences are 60 millisecond temporal resolution. So I think there's, if you look in the literature, there's a few kind of uh, proof of concept studies that have come out. Uh, most of them have just kind of look to say, can we look at the inflow across the mitral valve compared to the outflow across the aortic valve? A few have tried to say, let's try to do direct assessment. Um, but I think one is it still requires specialized post-processing tools to be able to do that. Uh, I think it's possible in the future that we may incorporate that more, but I think the techniques need to get more robust to be able to, to really make that part of mainstream. There are no other questions. Thank you so much. Great. Thank Thanks you very for much. coming down to give this great grand rounds.